We'll have to excuse the typhoon outside. Uh, don't worry about that. It, uh, you sound pretty good right now. It, okay. Uh, so I don't, I don't think there'd be too much problem. Okay, welcome. This is James Possible, and this is the Wealth Warriors Revolution podcast. Um, you can find me at startslaying.com. I have my uh, wealth group. It is called the Wealth Slaying Warriors. And this is part of my special series that I call um, Black Voices, Black Wealth Matters. And today with me is um, Danielle, Danielle Shelton. And we met, we met on um, LinkedIn. And actually, she's the first person um, that I've talked to so far that we just met. So this is, this is brilliant. I love this. She uh, was excited about the conversation. Um, as you said, right, you're all about the conversation. Yes. <laughs> and it's, it's an important conversation. So I think, I think, why don't we start with that thought there? Why is the conversation so important to you? Um, it's important to have the conversation as it pertains to um, black men and women and, and wealth. It's important to have that conversation because I can remember when I lived in Texas, right? Okay. My husband got the, he got the itch and he was like, we're going to move from Florida to Texas and we're going to have a huge Texas house and we're going to live the dream. And I was like, okay. So uh, <laughs> a long story short, um, while I was in Texas, I was an adjunct instructor Okay. And I would actually have students who would come up to me and who would say, I'm so glad I had you. I thought all black women were angry and ignorant. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for changing my mind. And I started saying, you know, I initially was offended, but the more it happened to me, the more I was like, I'm not really having a conversation about this. Like, because I, I was there instructor they felt comfortable enough to come to me but think about the amount of people that are not instructors that are not in control of somebody's grade and think about the amount of people that are not simply having a conversation and it was only because they were willing to engage me in dialogue during class that their opinion about me even shifted or changed and their opinion that they had wasn't even based on me because they didn't know me it was just based on these other factors that they, you know, came up with and they just decided that they were going to make a, an opinion about me, even though they had never met me. So having the conversation has become so important to me because I realize when you don't have the conversation, the amount of misinformation that happens. So that conversation, it has to take place. And then when we talked about wealth, and we talked about welfare and we talked about um, resources. The more and more I talked about the issues that plague the black community, the more and more I started to see um, some of the white students that I have be very uncomfortable with that level of conversation. But I was able to convey my thoughts in a way that allowed them to open up and see another perspective. And that, to me, is why the conversation is so important, because you have to be open to seeing a perspective that's other than yours. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's brilliant. And the idea of what you shared is, um, at first, you're taken back by it, right? And, yeah. and, and even a little bit offended, and then you recognize that, wait a second, this isn't just one or two people this is really where they all seem to be coming from in this particular moment. And it's like, okay, they're, whatever information they're getting, whatever they're learning is definitely creating a wall between you and them. And, yes. And it's not even, the wall doesn't even have anything about knowing anything about you, right? It's just, what they see and because you're different color of skin's different it's enough for them to have that thought to say okay this is this is what i learned about her and i don't even have to talk to her because i know that yeah 
And I, I can tell you, I know for sure my appearance made people uncomfortable. And mm-hmm. outside of just the skin tone, okay. I can remember when I was in Texas, I didn't have this. I didn't have this hair. Okay. I had a, an afro. And it oh, was a, nice. <laughs> nice. So were you doing afro puffs or did you have an afro? It was like a sizable afro nice. that I would wear semi pulled back okay, with it, some yeah. of my hair out. And I can tell that just my hair made people uncomfortable. And I just found that so interesting that something (laughs) that grows out of my head can cause discomfort. So um, them meeting me, it took a lot for them to to accept me as being a a person because I don't think they thought of me as a person before. But I think once they got to know me, it humanized. I I became human to them, and then they were like, "Oh, she's a she's a person." Wow, I I don't even know what to do with that. I mean, how do you? <clears throat> that's a lot to really process. Um, so I I grew up in California in the Bay Area, right? And so. Mm-hmm. You know, I had friends from Oakland to San Francisco, and, you know, it's a fairly mixed community. <clears throat> now, in where my house was, was really white. You know, we only had a couple black students. You know, I mean, it was just a handful. And mm-hmm. uh, one happened to be my neighbor, and we were, pretty, we were really close growing up. But, um, yeah, I just, it's a human... Because, you know, you read I've re- the history books, right, all the things they did to dehumanize yeah. a, pers- a person, you know, just because of the color of their skin and their, ha- their origin, their heritage. And um, to actually have that become, be a reality today for somebody to look at you and, and have that thought in the back it, that this isn't they're not like me they're not human they're they're and and to see and and so so you saw that progression right yes the the interaction change and um i saw their level of work change really yes when they when they didn't respect me as an instructor they gave me piss poor work and the more respect that they grew for me the better their work got Wow. So, I mean, what, what was that journey like for you? Because, I mean, you're an educator, right? So yes. learning is everything to you. And um, <clears throat> so how long did it take you to process all of this, too? Because surely you were processing some of this as well. Yeah, um, it was a Texas is, is huge. And I had a long commute. So um, on my days leaving class, it was hard. Um, And there would be times when I would just have an emotional moment with myself and just kind of take it in and be like, oh, my gosh, you know, and and then you start to feel for me, at least um, I started to feel like the universe was placing me somewhere purposely for me to be something. Yes. But I didn't know what that something was. And that was the frustrating part because I felt like that's where I was supposed to be. But I was I didn't know what I was supposed to do there. Um, And it didn't dawn on me until way later, years later, um, when I'm reading letters and I'm reading emails. It didn't dawn on me until then, until I was like, I was that person. Like I was that one person that they met that they could say, I know all people aren't like that. Right. And that was what I was supposed to do. And as an educator, it was hard to see them reject me and not know me. Right. (laughs) So to break down those walls um, became like my task. How can I make myself human? How can I I relate to them? How can I bring up issues and how can we read literature that helps them touch the part of them that says every human goes through this? Every person endures this. So I really had to struggle to find 
literary works that would tie in, oh, okay, so everybody experiences Mm -hmm. this. And then I would force conversation and I would make them talk and I was transparent and I was open. And because I was transparent and I was open, they opened up also. Now, let me say this. I didn't win the hearts of everybody, though I wanted to. Um, I did have one student in particular that was just hell bent on just hating me. And uh, he did tell me at the end that though he still doesn't like me, he at least does respect me as an instructor. So, (laughs) so, okay. Yeah. it was the best that it was the best that I could do. So I was like, okay, that's fine. At least, at least you got what you needed to get. And you know what? That's okay. Yeah. And that was a, that was a win. So that taught me how to take, how to have small wins. Right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Good for you. That's, that's powerful. Um, so for you personally, and, um, when, when do you recall money actually being a conversation? If you do, when you, you know, I don't know. Um, well, money was a conversation. Well, let me say this. My dad is a financial analyst. Oh, okay. (laughs) So you never know who I'm going to be talking to. That's interesting. Okay. Okay. And he has done it for the whole of his career. He is one of the ones that every time you talk to him, he's in his, he's 75, 76. Every time you talk to him, he's retiring. I'm retiring this year. I'm retiring this year, but he doesn't actually ever retire. So he's one of those people. Um, So I was taught finances at a very, very young age, um, how to put up money, how to save money, how to budget money, how to put money aside, how to do things in a certain way. And I um, am grateful for that because I realize everybody doesn't get that. And a lot of us, even with the teachings, I still got a credit card and ruined my credit initially when I was in college. Like, even though I knew better, I still did it anyway. Thank you. Um, I, did <laughs> I knew better, but I was like, I, I want this. And then, you know, I couldn't pay for it. So. You know how that goes college days, right? Um, But I started to, once I got out of college, I moved to Orlando. And when I was living in Orlando, I was living in a one bedroom studio, right? Super small, like literally one room. um, And it was not in the best place it was not in the best neighborhood and I think that was the first time it dawned on me money matters it really like it done it it kind of scathed me a little bit but I think college is like a safety net still sure once you get out of college and you're like a real adult then I was like oh this is so then I started to see okay how does this money thing work? And all of the lessons that I had been taught younger that I completely ignored in my twenties. Well, in my teens to twenties in a lot, my mid twenties, I started to say, this has to make sense. So then I started to do things to make sure that it made sense to me. And that was, that was different. And let me just say this, it was hard for me in college to apply for food stamps, but I did. Um, I leaned on governmental aid at one point. And for me, it was, it made me feel humiliated. Um, And then I wondered, I wonder how many people need this assistance, needs this assistance that feel like I felt. Right. (laughs) But I didn't have any children, you know, like I didn't have anything additional. It was just me. And I just couldn't, for whatever reason, make enough to have an apartment and to feed myself. So I had to apply for aid. And that's when it really became apparent, like you really have to be careful with money because the smarter me 
should have stayed on campus and not gotten an apartment at all. That would have been the smarter me. I would have stayed on campus. I would have stayed with the meal plan because I would have, I would then, I, I would not have had to worry about food because it was provided. It was within my plan. But for whatever reason, I was so determined to be a grown up so soon. And then I jumped into that life and I couldn't sustain myself. And I had to apply. And that's when I started to see huge disparities between what I got between how I was treated. Um, I then started to really see if you are at the bottom, like really at the bottom, people look at you different and people treat you different. And if you're black and you're at the bottom, you definitely get treated differently. And you know what question I got asked all the time? What's that? How many kids do you have? And I used to be like, none. Oh, you must have kids. No, I don't have kids. Well, every black woman over 20 has kids. I was told this. Every black woman over 20 has kids. So I was like, I'm, I, don't have it. I don't have any children. And apparently that was like a thing that if you needed assistance, you couldn't just fall on hard times on your own. You must have had lots of children and made really bad choices. And now here you are. And it's, it's hard to kind of take some of that in, like, okay, but the amount of times I had to justify, <laughs> I don't, I don't have children. I just don't let's, have any let's, money. Let's stop right there. there. So, so the people that you were asking those questions, who were they typically? Typically it would be because when you go in for, for food stamps, you have to get like counseling. I don't even know if they still do that. I might be dating myself right now. But you, you had to like go into an office so it wasn't like online and you had to fill out paperwork and then you would have to go through like an interview process. And then every so often they would revisit um, how your amount and revisit. And every time I would get the revisit, I would get the question and it was a white lady and she would ask. And then I asked, well, is that on my file that I have children? And she's like, no, it's not on your file. But. She was the one who said, and she works here, most black women, you know, over their 20s have children. And I was just like, oh, okay, well, I I don't. And I'm not sure she ever believed (laughs) that I didn't. (laughs) But but it was it was interesting, to say the least. And I just I can remember that feeling and I can remember saying to myself I don't ever want to feel like this again no. I don't ever want to have to depend on governmental assistance again and even though I was in college and people justify it when you are black and you are on governmental aid people don't give you a justification you can't say I was in college it is automatically looked at as this horrible thing that you have done And how dare you take taxpayers money because you were lazy and you were like, you become this weird stereotype that doesn't really fit. Right. That's. um, um, Yeah. So when you think about the way you share that you felt right. Um, And to think that, you, you know, I talk about, and I'm sure you'll, you'll, chime in on this thought too is that um i because of my youth my my trauma that i grew through um trauma has really been something that i've studied a lot and mm. general generational trauma is a very real thing yeah and especially when we're talking about the black community and we're talking about slavery and you know 400 plus years of this cycle right we're talking 14, 15 or more generations Mm -hmm. that have gone through this. And one of the conversations I had on LinkedIn today, you know, um, while legally slavery may be over, um, slavery still exists. It just has a different name to it. And we systemically um, have systems that, that disable empowerment wouldn't you you follow what i'm saying 
I and, absolutely follow. Yeah. Yeah. And so through that, um, we, we are still enslaving people and um, it's, it's tragic. It's tragic. And to know that, you know, that there are people that are capable and that just, I would think I would question, you know, and, and maybe you can add to this. I mean, if you don't have an environment around you and you, you haven't seen that, like through generationally looking through your parents, through your grandparents, if you don't see that kind of support, the example you see is what you're living um, and not feeling good about yourself itself <clears throat> just seems to kind of trans transcend, right? Just down. It does. And, and, it does. And that's a heavy, that's a heavy load to carry. <laughs> It is. And I'm going to tell you this. When I was teaching, I started out teaching in middle school okay. and I taught at um, an all white, super, super suburban school, <clears throat> middle school. They never needed materials. I had moms who would come in and who would volunteer because they were stay at home moms. And um, I had really high level students and it was an interesting um, transition. I would have the, I had the helicopter mom of course. Um, but it was really interesting. And then when I moved from Orlando back to South Florida, um, I got a job teaching at an inner city school and I taught at that inner city school for eight years. And the difference was amazing. And I saw kids who as a team, because we would have a team of teachers, which would mean um, English, math, science, and social studies, we all would be a team and we all would have the same kids. Okay. So on my, on my team, we would all get together and we would figure out what kid needs shoes, what house needs groceries, who, who came to school in clothes that couldn't be washed. And sometimes um, the custodian would open the school a little bit earlier for certain students who had to wash their clothes in school because they could not wash them at home. Um, there were some, some of my students, I can remember specifically one student who extremely bright young man um, didn't have running water in his house, like no running water. And he told us that they were using buckets to go to the bathroom in his house. So to go from seeing this upper level, like school with all these resources and all these people who were doing fairly well to go into this inner city neighborhood where these kids just needed so much. Um, I can tell you for sure it was draining, like emotionally yeah. and mentally every day to try to be the one to save them and be the one to provide for them and be the one to to say, you know, let me help you out and be the one to push them on. And you really had to be the voice. And that is when I started to do more than teach. Teaching in that inner city school made me step away from my subject matter and made me step into the role of just listening, just hearing them, just being able to have a day where we're not doing work today. Let's just talk about what happened. What happened yesterday, the amount of trauma that those kids experience is amazing. But the um, their resilience as they developed ways to fight through their trauma. It's something that I hadn't seen before. So when I and then we started to get together and as a team, the math teacher, she was our team leader and she came up with a plan. She's like, we're going to do like a life skills project and we're going to say, if this is your job, then this is how much you make, then this is what you can afford. And she started doing like life skills. Nice. So we took it upon ourselves to say, you know what, these kids are not getting some of the lessons that we got. And is life skills on our curriculum? No. But our environment says we have to teach these kids these skills or they're not going to get it. Right. And we really tried our best to save every last one of them. And some of them really got it and really moved forward. 
and it was just it was hard it was hard but I loved I loved the little wins I loved the small wins I had a student who um her hair was natural she had an afro this was at the same time that I had an afro and she would fight in every classroom except for mine <laughs> And I didn't know why she would get kicked out of the room. And she'd be like, well, can I just go to, to Miss Brown? I was Miss Brown at that time. Can I just go to Miss Brown's class? And I'm like, sure. And so then this kid shows up. And I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, I don't know. I got kicked out. So I'm like, what is going on? And she let me know that she really liked me because she and I had the same hair. And then I was like, oh, got it. Okay. So she feels like she can relate to me. But it really helped me to see these kids need so much more and I am passionate about trying to give them every ounce of myself that I can because they they need it and when it comes to finances I want them to know that 